Welcome to a special Thursday webinar. I'm Adam Jorgensen. I'm with Pragmatic Works. As you probably already know, that's who you dialed into to look at today is Pragmatic Works and some of the Power BI stuff that we're talking about. So let's uh, let's jump in. What we're going to talk about today is sort of why we see Power BI as you know a, a big part of the future of a lot of customers. BI environments that are making customers the you know most successful with Power BI and some of the things that you know are are holding customers back, right? That's why we asked you some of those poll questions. I wanted to know kind of where where this audience was at so we can adapt that a little bit on the fly. Um, but we spent a lot of time with our consulting team over the last 12 months and our customers over the last 12 months, uh, a couple uh, about uh, two or three hundred customers all using Power BI in some form or fashion. And we've we've rolled all of that up into a, hopefully a pretty straightforward and simple conversation uh, that we wanna have with you today. So <clears throat> hopefully by the end of this session, you're gonna understand, you know, maybe there's some opportunities that, uh, that you have to improve or expand the way that you're using Power BI. Um, you're gonna understand you're not alone <laughs> in some of those challenges that you're facing with Power BI. Uh, a lot of other organizations are, are facing those as well. I think you noticed when, uh, when Crystal put up the, uh, the the poll and the poll results, pretty even distribution. I think we're seeing that as well with our customers. And I think it's really important uh, for you guys to understand. It's probably not something you're doing or not doing. It's just the, the nature of how customers adopt Power BI. We're also going to talk about how adoption has some challenges and then how some of the latest and greatest features, um, some of them are brand new. Some of them have been around for a little bit, but we're just not seeing as much uptick in them as, as we would expect. So we wanna make sure that people know about them. Uh, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about how Pragmatic Works can help you solve some of those. So fair warning, there's a little bit of a helpful pitch at the end um, as we go through, but I wanna make sure that you guys really understand uh, how to do this on your own first. Uh, and then we can obviously talk about how we help you. So let's jump right in and talk about why Power BI is sort of crushing the competition in the BI market. Now there's a lot of focus around, you know, is it Power BI, is it Tableau, is it Click, is it Domo, is it Burst? You know, there's all these other tools out there. And when it comes down to it, we have the opportunity as a partner to sort of pick <clears throat> and choose, you know, which tools we recommend for customers. And if we thought Tableau was the best choice, we'd be a, a strong Tableau partner. Uh, we're not just picking Power BI because we like other stuff. That, uh, that Microsoft picks. Um, you know, we wouldn't pick the Seattle Seahawks in the NBA draft, right? It's, it's a different, uh, you know, there's different skills for different teams. Um, but because all of your data is available so quickly and they're releasing new capabilities every month and we have the ability to say, how do we want it? Do we want it on our desktop? Do we want it delivered? Do we want it on mobile? Do we want it embedded? Do we want to use it to share publicly? Do we want it in our blog or published to web? We'll talk about that. Uh, it's really the, the one platform for BI that we find is designed for the data-driven organization. And that doesn't just mean the organization that wants to do reporting or dashboards. There's lots of dashboarding tools. It's the, it's the platform that's best designed to help you understand and organize your data report on that information, push that information into a, you know, an actionable process, and then collaborate on that information while it's being published. Um, and you would get all of that for a price that's pretty low in the market. I mean, I hear people say, oh, you know, I hate having to pay per user, but you know, they've obviously never gotten one of these big enterprise bills from, uh, from some of these other vendors, right? I, we have a customer that's paying almost a million dollars a year uh, for Tableau, and they have like, 15 people using it. That's not a really good per user cost, uh, especially not for the value they're getting. Tableau is not a bad tool, does a lot of really great things. Um, and they had some, some things even before Power BI did. Um, but, you know, Microsoft pivoted pretty hard uh, a couple of years ago and has, you know, since accelerated right past everybody. And so today we're going to talk about some of the big features that, you know, really help them, them do that and help Power BI become this you know centralized place that we believe is kind of the future of, of BI. We're going to talk about natural language Q and A, published to web, the integration with other parts of Azure, uh, or frankly AWS if you have it. Uh, hopefully nobody from Microsoft's on the call, but you know Power BI does work with things in AWS as well. Uh, a lot of our customers are multi-cloud, so that's super important. 
uh, things like curated content packs, custom visualizations. We, we can visualize anything we want in Power BI. And if we can't figure out how to do it, we can build a visualization uh, from scratch that will allow us to do it. I mean, that's pretty cool. We have airline customers and we've built custom models of their airplanes. I mean, we can make things very, very specific if you want to, or you don't have to, we can just make charts. I mean, we can just keep it simple so that you don't have to spend the time doing that. Uh, we've got things like DAX, Power Query, uh, and the semantic engine that run underneath Power BI. Uh, we have data-driven alerting. So if your data changes, you don't have to be staring at it all day. That's pretty powerful. Uh, and then licensing and the price versus some of the competition, it, it's, it's incredibly competitive, uh, incredibly uh, accessible. So we'll talk about how that makes a big difference. Uh, and then, of course, we have Power BI Premium. Those are the top nine. And I'm going to save the one feature uh, as a secret for last. So we'll get to that in a minute. Natural language q and I don't know how many of you are using this, but the ability to go in and just say, what are my sales for North Carolina, right? How many sales did Bob have last year? What are Bob's sales of refrigerators in North Carolina, right? How many of my um, machines went over temperature in the last seven days? Being able to do that is incredibly powerful. It means that you don't have to account for every single question that a user is going to ask in a report. I mean, I've seen reports that have, I mean, a couple hundred visuals on them. And it's, it's kind of, it kind of makes me seasick a little bit when I look at it. I mean, I'm like, oh, you know, I'm kind of weaving back and forth a little bit as I'm staring at this report. I don't know how people do it all day, but that used to be how we had to do it, right? We had to go, Every time a user came up with something, oh, we didn't think about that. Oh, we missed that. All right, we'll add that to, to a report. And we would just cobble, cobble, cobble and add all these visualizations to these reports. And it turned into one report to rule them all kind of thing instead of a system where we could ask intelligent questions and get intelligent answers. And so if you haven't uh, seen Natural Language QA in action, check out our YouTube channel. Uh, I know we have some either Azure Everyday content or content from our training team on using natural language Q&A. It's incredibly impactful, incredibly powerful for your business because then you can focus on the big picture items like we have here. How are our new stores uh, doing versus Target? What are our sales? Uh, what are our, um, uh, you know, how many stores are we opening? Uh, and how are the new and the existing stores performing and what's the variance, right? That's going to cover 60%. But obviously, you know, one of my first questions is, I, that's great. All the new stores are doing well, but is one new store doing better than the others, right? So what I would like to see is what's the average new store performance? Well, I can ask those kinds of questions in natural language Q&A. And so remember this, this is one of the things that really helps uh, our top customers in terms of adoption, in terms of they're rolling out Power BI faster than anybody. They're almost all using natural language Q&A to help uh, drive that. The second thing that they're using is published to web. So uh, you started seeing this on Power BI bloggers, uh, blogs, because it made it so much easier to publish demos <laughs> and to publish things out to people's individual websites. But uh, don't confuse this with Power BI Embedded. It's not exactly the same as Embedded. Um, what this allows you to do is publish this uh, out to the web and have it update and stay live. Uh, but it's not necessarily a full Power BI uh, experience and that's okay because we have embedded for the full Power BI experience as a service embedded versus published to web for just consumption and so if you've got reporting that you need to publish into an internal web app or things like that and you don't need the full functionality of embedded this is a great option and it's simple right it's click file click publish to web it's going to be very uh, very simple and straightforward to get deployed again the whole focus of Power BI and as a Power BI developer, and those of you who are already doing enterprise deployments, uh, I'm sure that you're already seeing this, is lowering the friction, speeding the development, and making sure that the business has information that they can use, that, that you trust, and that they're not sort of all cobbling things together um, that you know, may be inaccurate because it's just coming from different places and is, and is embedded. Number three, a large number of our customers have a pretty significant portion of their data in Azure, right? Pragmatic Works is focused on, you know, everything cloud data and analytics. And so it would make sense that our customer base is a little biased toward the cloud, but that's okay. And so uh, they are running things like Power BI, Power Apps, Microsoft Flow. They're starting to experiment with how they can 
automate and accelerate their business using some of these different tools, uh, even things like logic apps. And so as they're doing that, they're finding that Power BI integrates very well with these different environments, right? You can trigger Microsoft flows based off of Power BI activity. Uh, these different things interact and integrate very tightly, both from a functionality perspective and an identity perspective, meaning that if you're using things like Azure Active Directory and other tools like that, that, you know, all of that identity management is going to be very simple and straightforward, and you get sort of one cloud experience, which uh, has been, again, lower the friction, speed the adoption, make it easier uh, for those who are going to be consuming and developing on the platform. Speaking of making it easier, a lot of customers are taking advantage of curated content packs just to get them started. Uh, you know, we are a Salesforce shop uh, at Pragmatic Works. We use Salesforce as our CRM. Uh, we took this Salesforce content pack and ran with it. Um, it's great. It gave us, you know, 40% of the reports that we wanted out of the box. We got those up and running in a couple of weeks. And now, you know, we just manage those. And now every week we, we add to it, of course, you know, for the last year and a half. So now we have more. Um, but those, uh, you know, those are less than we originally anticipated because we came from this mindset of, well, we got to build a report to answer all these super important questions. And we, what did we do? We actually stepped back and went back to natural language Q and A. And we said, Hey, how can we leverage this so that we don't have to take an expensive development resource and continue to build out, you know, 10% variations uh, of every report. And so we started with content packs for things like um, Salesforce, QuickBooks Online, which is uh, our financial system. Uh, we have HubSpot, which is our marketing automation system. We have uh, uh, GitHub for some of our development. We have Google Analytics for additional marketing, uh, for our website, blog traffic, social, all that kind of stuff. Um, we have SQL Sentry uh, because as you guys know, we. Uh, Recently, SQL Century acquired our software portfolio, and we have an excellent partnership with them. Um, they help us with some of our managed services offerings. Uh, and so we want to be able to work very closely with their tools, and they've published their own content packs for their software. A lot of other ISVs have as well. And so uh, we can also pull in things like our Azure telemetry data. So there's lots of ways to get started, and you're not starting from zero. You're starting from, from the 50-yard line in most cases, right? There's some reports. There's a model. There's some uh, query editor stuff already built out. All that stuff is already there. You just have to connect it up and start exploring. And so curated content packs can be a great way to get started or even just to showcase uh, to your business or to, uh, to your IT department and maybe vice versa that this is not, you know, doesn't have to be a big thing to get started, right? There's, there's ways to start. You're not starting from zero. The connections and things can all be set up uh, and they don't have to learn from zero to get started. Uh, this is one of my favorite things, right? This is just custom visualizations. Any opportunity to avoid a terrible pie chart is amazing. And so there are hundreds of custom visualizations. If you want to see them, Devin Knight um, does an amazing blog series on our blog at pragmaticworks.com. He's doing, I think, one a week of every custom visualization. He's been doing it for over a year. It's just this incredibly exhaustive, amazing uh, coverage of all of these custom visualizations. And so you can get an idea of, uh, you know, lots of different ways to showcase your data. One thing I would caution you on on custom visualizations is there's a lot from third-party vendors you can, you know, download and, and pay for in the marketplace and put in your reports. Uh, don't use a custom visualization just because you think it looks cool. Make sure that it's really giving you the opportunity to provide clarity to a message, right? So for example, some of these, um, you can see the force directed graph, you know, up in the middle, right? That's a very particular type of message and a particular type of audience uh, that can really read that, uh, that particular graph versus maybe something like a heat map or a, uh, a tornado chart down in the bottom left. Um, or the, the calendar visualization is actually one of my favorite. We use this for consulting planning, reporting, uh, the one that's in the bottom, almost all the way over to the right. That gives us an idea of sort of, you know, heat and activity around different parts of the calendar and around different parts of the year. And then if you don't find what you're looking for in the visualization library, uh, you can build it or we can help you build it. There's lots of opportunity to build very custom visualizations to match your business. We have customers who've built call center layouts and 
you know, floor plans for, you know, um, uh, manufacturing plants or ov map overlays for things like smart grid and things like that. So there's a lot of potential uh, to be able to do those kinds of things that really doesn't exist in the same way uh, in other platforms. So custom visualizations are being used. A lot of customers, not, you know, a certain number of them are coming to Power BI because of a particular visualization, because of a particular opportunity to express that information. Uh, now I'm going to nerd out a little bit on this one. So if you guys are, are not Excel folks, or if you're not, you know, developers, you may not understand the value of this, but being able to write effectively MDX multidimensional type queries, which if any of you have ever written those, you know, they're not easy. Um, you know, I used to know a ton about MDX. I was super deep. I could tune it. I could tell you how the engine worked and I, I, can still do a little bit of that, but you probably don't want me tuning your MDS anymore. It's not what I do day to day. Um, but I don't need to do that. And I'm so grateful to this Power BI team because that I don't need to do that, that I can just learn DAX because you know what I do still remember is I still remember a lot of my Excel formulas. And if I know those, DAX is gonna be a pretty short hop, skip and a jump. Now it's definitely got some a, a ton of additional capability to be able to handle some of those multidimensional things. And there's still a, few kind of edge MDX things that it doesn't handle just because of the nature of, you know, the engine that they're still continuing to evolve, but it's pretty small. Uh, and I, we've only run into that maybe twice, I don't know, in three years. So that it's, it doesn't really happen very often, but by using DAX and the query editor and power query, you can essentially uh, do your, almost do your own ETL, right? For the for you BI folks on the phone, I apologize. I don't want to, I don't want people leaving saying I can do ETL and power query, but for all intents and purposes, you kind of can. Uh, you basically can bring that data together, you can transform it, you can create calculated columns and tables. Uh, we can assign and create data models. Uh, we can assign um, you know, particular data types and particular sort of filters and governance. So there's a lot of that ETL type functionality that we can do from within Power Query. Uh, it doesn't mean we go and replace our ETL with Power Query, but it does mean that you don't necessarily have to wait on an ETL system to be developed you can bring all that data into Power Query on your own and then do that work on top of it with DAX, which is incredibly powerful. And then once you have all that data and the data does something, right? Something happens like, you know, a dollar value goes up or down, a percentage goes out of variance. We can take that and connect it up with Power BI and Microsoft Flow and have it start kicking alerts out. Uh, and we can use Flow, which is you know built in this, uh, to the Office 365 suite, um, to really take advantage of anything happening with our data based on an alert threshold, uh, and push out alerts, uh, either data driven or time driven or threshold driven. Uh, we can build a pretty significant system, uh, pretty intricate or pretty simple, whatever you want to do. But we can push things out to mobile. We can push things out through an app. We can tie that into other flows, which kick off, you know, workflows or on call or ticketing workflows. Uh, there's all sorts of things that can be done based off of these types of integrations. So uh, once, once a number of our customers are getting that data in, if that data is important, then they want to track it. They don't want to have to stare at the report and hit refresh all day, which is, you know, ideally not the best use of their time. We set up data-driven alerts and we make sure that uh, they always know sort of no news is good news and they can check it every day. If something happens in the middle of the day, uh, they're going to get an alert. Uh, license pricing, Office 365. This is one of the easiest pricing scenarios I've ever seen. I know some people have, you know, oh, I don't, you know, pro versus, you know, um, premium. And, you know, we have to pay for pro. And there can be a lot of questions around those kinds of things. We're happy to help you guys navigate that. Just reach out to us and we'll, we'll chat through it with you. Um, I know they've changed these licensing formats a little bit. Some of this changes as the footprint of the technology changes, right? It's how we got Power BI Premium because there used to be more levels than this. And one of our pieces of feedback was streamline all of this, right? Cut it down to, you know, a very good free version, a pro version that, you know, gives you guys, you know, a little bit more capability, a lot more collaboration, you know, auditing and governance and some of those kinds of things, as well as the ability to sort of package and distribute stuff, stuff a real enterprise or a real business would need, right? I mean, you're not just an individual sort of analyst. And then we need, for the larger customers that we have, we need dedicated capacity. We need to be able to plan for performance. We need to, you know, embed content without additional licensing costs. And, you know, we just need a, 
an all-in-one bucket where we write a little bit bigger check, uh, but we can, you know, know that we can consume whatever we want within that uh, and that we get dedicated capacity. And so uh, what that turns into is all of our data sources, reports, dashboards, et cetera, they're all running in a set, uh, dedicated set of hardware and fabric uh, in the Azure cloud. And that is uh, that can be really incredibly powerful for a lot of our our customers to be able to, you know, under, you know, count on the the capacity that they have, scale that up and down. Uh, most customers don't need the capacity side, right? They benefit more from the all you can consume licensing and embedding. Uh, uh, you know, once you get above a certain number of users, it just starts to make sense from an economic perspective. And then the dedicated capacity is is a benefit. So uh, those are my top nine. But the number one Power BI opportunity is really to finally centralize your company around a single platform. And so what we see is we see a lot of customers that come in and they have, they say, well, we have Office 365 or we're, we're going to buy Office 365 and we see Power BI and we like Power BI. We're really intrigued by it. We piloted it. There's somewhere in that first, you know, 30%, right? We had uh, in our first poll, we said 53% of you said you're, you're getting started, right? That's about what we see. Yeah, about 50 to 60% of the customers are getting started. And you'll see all these features and you go, man, we just want to try everything. And I don't know what to prioritize. And that's okay. We're going to talk about in just a minute how we get the best results. But the most important thing is to not fall into what I call the Skype trap. Because we have this challenge with Skype at Pragmatic Works. We have Skype, Skype for Business, and Microsoft Teams. And because they don't all completely overlap, <laughs> we use them to talk to different people, we're stuck running a couple of different platforms. And that is incredibly frustrating. It just, it, it can be very frustrating. I know it's a little bit of first world problems, but it is incredibly frustrating. And so we don't want that to happen. That's okay in our IM chat collab world. It's not great, but we're fixing it. And Microsoft's collab collapsing some of those platforms and it'll get better, right? But with Power BI, we've got it all in one place. There's no reason to run 30% of it in Power BI and 40% of it in, old, in an old MicroStrategy, Cognos type of environment, and then 20, 10% you know, over in a Tableau environment. Just move it all through. And it's actually pretty straightforward to migrate if you start looking at reports that you're actually using. We had a customer the other day say, oh, we need to migrate 5,500 reports from Cognos over to Power BI. And I said, well, chances are you, you don't. You probably need to migrate 20% of that. And that's because of things like, uh, one, you're probably not using all 5,500 reports. So let's just take 30% off the top because that's about what we see. So if you take a third of that off, now they're down to about 4,000 reports. Um, out of those 4,000 reports, they're probably uh, about 50% of those are probably some variation like a you know, let's look at this by state or by time or by rep, right? That's all, we can build that all into this one Power BI report with, with slicers, right? So we can kill three to five birds with one stone uh, or with one Power BI dashboard uh, in many cases and get you the same type of, uh, you know, capability. Uh, so that type of, you know, mind, mind and thought process is incredibly important, right? We don't, have to stay the way we are because the barriers that used to exist don't exist anymore, right? The cost to move is much lower. The footprint when you move is much smoother, much more streamlined. So there's things to keep in mind. Your number one opportunity with Power BI is to centralize it around a single platform. And if you're thinking about doing that, how do you get the best results? Well, there's a few, a few steps, right? And some of you can combine some of these and some of you can skip some of them, but I wanted to call out the things that you know, as we looked at three to 400 customers over the last couple of years that are all going through this Power BI transformation, uh, these are the things that, that they have done and we have helped with that have made the biggest difference. And that's what I wanted you to get to take away from today. So they went in with a plan. They understood where is Power BI going to give us the biggest bang for our buck and where do we want to start? Then they cataloged anything they had existing that they would need to move move to Power BI or connect up to Power BI. So that could be, hey, we have sales reports in Salesforce. Great, why don't we compare those with the curated content pack in Salesforce? And by doing that, we can see maybe we have 50% of our reports already done. They're different. They're not exactly how we would develop them, 
but they're done on you know day seven, right? Once we get it up and running, instead of having to port and redevelop everything from scratch. They form the right partnerships. So they make sure that they're close with their Microsoft team who has Power BI resources available in the field, and they get a partner like Pragmatic Works, whether that's through our, our on-demand training to help ramp their team up, whether it's through us uh, getting them ramped up or managing their Power BI environment for them. Uh, and then we help prioritize what things should they attack. Uh, is it net new development for the business? Is it migrating off a legacy system? We have a lot of customers who come in and they say, look, I don't want to pay Teradata and Cognos another $3 million next year. And we go, great, let's get you off of that system so that doesn't have to happen. So sometimes there's a, a time horizon there. Uh, and then we prototype some examples using things like natural Q&A, uh, custom visualizations, maybe Power BI Premium so that they're uh, getting their biggest bang for the buck. And we get feedback on sort of what that process looks like uh, and how they like consuming that data. And from there, their team, our team, if we're engaged, can accelerate and begin parallelizing and executing on those workloads. And then once they have this all centralized and they're really running in more of a data-driven way, their business starts to grow, right? It's, it's not a question. It's a fact that the most data-driven businesses are typically the most profitable and most successful businesses. The ones that focus on analytics and drive their business off of data are largely more successful, more profitable, and have higher growth percentages, uh, and have a higher employee morale uh, because things become less about, well, this is Bob's pet project or Adam's pet project. It's just, this is what we need to do, right? The, the data typically doesn't lie. If we're looking at it the right way and we're using it to inform what we're doing, then you know, ideally we're removing biases, removing priorities and, you know, creating a lot more uh, value as we go forward. But everybody's not crushing it. So why is that? Why isn't everybody running their entire enterprise on Power BI? So we went through and talked to a number of customers who we knew were having problems. Uh, ones that have come to us, ones that we meet uh, at conferences, ones that come up to our booths, and we've been tracking this for um, for about a year. And so I went through all the quotes and the comments and things that we pulled out. And we use this stuff to to help build, you know, our offerings and help make sure that what we're offering is solving problems for customers. Otherwise, you know, what's the point, right? So these are probably the five or six that I think are most impactful uh, to me. They stand out the most to me. We want Power BI, but we can't seem to get traction with it or understand how to get going with it. Uh, this is holding up their rollout until IT can get around to manage. So what happened here is the business got IT in their or got off Power BI in their Office 365 migration. They got super excited about it. They tried it out. They hit a wall, probably around data access. And then they called IT and the IT department said, okay, all right, well, this isn't really on our project portfolio for the quarter. And, you know, we don't have resources to work on. We'll, we'll try, right? They handed it off to the data team. The data team didn't really have time. And it's just, it's on the back burner. And so you've got a, a line of business that's ready to go, that's super excited about, you know, how they move forward with Power BI. And they can't because, unfortunately, it's become an IT project, which is not really the best way to roll it out. Um, nothing against IT, but they're just, they're, they're busy too, right? So you can't just dump it in another busy team's lap and expect things to get done. Um, the second one is our business knows they can get better reporting and insight with Power BI, but they find themselves without the ability to deliver the Power BI reports on their enterprise data. And so what's happened here is the, the customer doesn't know how to get their people ramped up on Power BI. They've got them some training. Their team hasn't taken the training because they, they haven't had time, you know? So there hasn't been this cultural shift of, you know, they're just saying, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. And they're like, well, when, when do you want us to do this? Um, Power BI experience is hard to find in the market. There's not a lot of, freelance or people looking to move between companies that are experts in Power BI. You know, unfortunately for a lot of customers, a lot of that expertise is still in the, the consulting space. Uh, same thing with Tableau, right? There's a lot of good independent folks that, you know, are independent consultants at a, at a very premium rate. Uh, but there is no sort of accessible, you know, consulting level offering for, for Power BI. Uh, and it's hard to just go hire direct. So typically what customers are doing is they're hiring somebody with the intention of give, making them the Power BI point person, uh, getting them ramped up. But as soon as that person gets in the door, what happens to their time? That goes to 15 other things after a couple of weeks, right? 
Um, our internal resources don't have the time to learn technology and keep up with their day to day. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Especially if that's data teams, right? Data teams are often working day hours and evening hours, you know, for projects, change control, all those kinds of things. Uh, and so adding in training and ramp up is, is possible, right? They're always learning new things, but it's going to take time. Something that might take 30 days of dedicated time to get pretty, uh, pretty professional at, uh, could take over a year if you're doing it, you know, five hours a week, uh, that that's, that's going to take a while. Right. And that's okay. Uh, it's the way organic learning has to happen, but it doesn't help you in trying to get your, uh, your work done. Right. Um, our lack of experience means we don't understand what the tool can do for us. Well, that's part of what today is about, right? Um, they, they seen all the flashy demos. They've seen Satya Nadella get up and talk about Power BI. They've seen James Phillips get up and talk about all the, the changes and the roadmap and the innovation. And they've heard partners talk about, wow, new things coming out every month. And they get all the Pragmatic Works YouTube videos about all the changes and they just go, oh, it's too much. It's too much. How can they handle all of that? I, I don't know. I, I don't think you can. Um, and so what happens then is IT has no time to design and manage the architecture. So they, they look at Power BI and they say, well, this is really needs to be a data warehouse and it needs to plug into our enterprise data strategy. And, you know, sometimes that's, that's good, right? But really what it just needs to be able to do is connect the data that's been sort of pre-approved for the business to go consume. And maybe that's data that's in your data warehouse. Maybe that's data that's in a couple of marts. Maybe it's in a lake. Maybe it's just in the line of business apps like Salesforce, QuickBooks, JD Edwards, your production applications, your website app. Um, there will be things IT has to do to protect, uh, you know, the app from the tool in some cases, right? Make a copy of the data or make sure security is in place. Uh, make sure the architecture is good. But uh, requiring a complete redo of the enterprise data architecture before Power BI starts to be used is, is a very waterfall and antiquated approach. And I understand there are some niche use cases where you can't introduce a new tool in certain government or um, you know, um, uh, sovereign type workloads, but even banking, financial services, insurance, there are absolutely workloads where Power BI can start that are not uh, as restrictive as some others. And so, you know, again, going back to prioritizing, and understanding what we can do and what with the cataloging, what opportunities we have. Don't focus on the one that's incredibly hard to start with. Focus on the one that is accessible, that allows people to get in there and start learning. And so to help solve a lot of these problems, uh, we stepped back and said, how can we help, right? We have a team of Power BI folks that are rock stars. Uh, we've done this work for, you know, a very large number of customers over the last couple of years. We understand the problems. How can we start taking this burden with customers and helping them, you know, really become the heroes uh, in their organization? And so uh, we put together a managed services package, which, uh, you know, you'll have the opportunity to ask for more information about after the session. We're not going to harass you about it. But I just wanted to share it with you since we all happen to be together. So we've got uh, a way to develop reports about 75% faster, eliminate your backlog. You've got a lot of stuff going on our team can knock out those backlog reports or get you started. We can help your IT department accelerate getting Power BI into the enterprise, getting security, identity, data organization, governance, all those things uh, worked out, mapped out uh, and fixed. And we can help you cut through the noise, right? We will absorb all of that Power BI goodness that it's coming out all the, you know, 50 changes a month and improvements. And we'll bring that back to you and say, this is what matters to your business. You're a bank, you're an insurance, company, you're a professional sports team, you're an auto manufacturer. This is what matters. This is what you should be taking advantage of based on what we know. Uh, and we did it in a way that's super flexible, right? Because obviously if we did all this and then said, yep, it's going to be $200,000 a year for dedicated consultants and here's your bill. And oh, that's, that's, uh, that's going to sort of blow the whole thing, right? It's not really a very good value. Um, if we're not helping you achieve it at a reasonable cost. And so we've structured this to be three tiers. Uh, first tier, we can come in and help develop and manage your reports and dashboards, uh, help you guys optimize performance uh, and look at your Power BI tenant architecture and support you guys through business hours. Tier two, we'll take over management of your tenant if you'd like, right? We can handle all the workspace, security app, data refresh, troubleshooting, all of that. Uh, and both of these include a a good bucket of development hours that's flexible based on what you need. 
And as a cloud solution provider partner for Microsoft, we can also do tier three, which includes 24 seven support. We can package all your Office 365 and Power BI licensing, Azure licensing, uh, all right through um, and uh, handle all of your development and all of your admin. And then every tier, no matter how you engage with the solution, we do very rigorous status reporting. We'll do ROI conversations on make sure you're getting the value. We'll get you guys briefings on relevant new Power BI features. Of course, our team uses best practice development and admin capabilities. We'll gear all of that towards what we know is coming on the roadmap because we work directly with the Power BI admin team. So there's going to be none of this. Well, we built it this way today, but we're going to build it a different way tomorrow because they release a new feature that nobody knew about. You'll be able to get special pricing for our entire on-demand training platform. Uh, and then we're going to bring back custom recommendations for your architecture uh, and your business. And so, you know, if this is something that's exciting to you, you'll get a follow-up uh, question here at the end of the webinar. If, you, if it's interesting, please say yes. We'd love to talk to you more about how we can help you guys, especially those of you that are getting started um, and are working through enterprise deployments. This is something that's been very popular with our customers. We've been doing this now for a little while and we just decided to package it up and, you know, do a bit of a release and a launch for it. So I wanted to just take a breath and, uh, give you guys an opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, and uh, that's all the real content that I had today. I wanted to make sure we covered those big features, how our customers are being successful. Uh, hopefully we hit all the buttons that, that you were looking for and closed some gaps for you and helped you realize that some of your challenges you're dealing with, you're not alone. Um, and in the meantime, you know, we're here to help, whether it's through our managed services platform or just a, an email question. So, you know, we're here to help you wherever your point of need is. So at this point, Crystal, do we have any questions in the, in the backlog for the, for the group? Yeah, we have a couple of questions. Um, let me see here. There is a question from, let's go down. It says it's from, oh, please forgive me if I mispronounced your ass. I want to say Igor. What is the latest, what is the largest database you can import for Q&A? He wanted to know. Uh, you know, Igor, that's a good question. I That has probably changed since the last time I looked, um, but um, it's pretty good size. It's basically the, the the max size of the Power BI data model, which I think um, is in the low terabytes right now. So I, I can get you a specific information on that. Matter of fact, if you go on our YouTube page, there's probably a video on it from Devin and our team. Perfect. Um, the next question is from Cesar. And he wants to know, what are the advantages of Power BI versus MicroStrategy and SAP BI? Mm, yeah, that's a that's a good question. That would be a that would be a half day webinar in and of itself. But I'll I'll cut I'll cut through it. Right. So the number one advantage for Power for Power BI is the ability for it to connect to everything. Now MicroStrategy will also connect to things, but the queries that it writes under the covers make it incredible incredibly difficult to run on top of certain systems. Um, we work with a lot of the Microsoft data platform teams that are building out SQL Server and Azure Data Warehouse in the cloud, Cosmos DB. MicroStrategy is one of the last uh, to get certified because the queries that it pumps out are so, so uh, convoluted and gnarly. Um, Power BI doesn't have that problem. It's, it's built to run natively with a bunch of different platforms. Um, and then when you get into SAP, Power BI, can uh, can connect directly to a number of SAP's platforms, uh, specifically because of the partnership that Microsoft has with SAP. So even if the even if the functionality was comparable, which it's not, we still have things like natural language Q and A. There's more AI being built into Power BI. Um, the pricing strategy is completely different. You're going to be able to access it um, very effectively uh, unless you have some kind of special deal with SAP. So hopefully that helps at least point you in the right direction. Okay, the next question is from Cesar again, too. He wants to know, how do we migrate our reports from business objectives to Power BI? And are there any tools? Yeah, there's not there's not a lot of tools, but typically the way we approach it is kind of how I said a few minutes ago, right? We come in, uh, we do kind of a, usually a free design session with you. We sit down, we look at the reports, we talk about how many of them there are. Usually we take a subset uh, that gets a line of business or a department or a functional area uh, up to speed and we we do that first as a prototype um typically what we're doing is reusing a lot of those data sets and queries and we're just repackaging the visualizations to work better uh, in power bi so usually it's a pretty straightforward process but automated tools 
Uh, ironically, we looked into writing an automated tool and with Power BI, we can totally do it because the destination supports it, but all of the, um, the sources, the business objects, microstrategies, all these guys, they all prohibit automated tools from doing anything uh, with their software because they know um, that their stuff is legacy and it's harder to migrate from quote unquote. And, uh, but because again, we can kind of collapse reports into one within Power BI, uh, we, we usually make that a much better experience for customers. So if that's something you're interested in, you know, please let us know. All righty, the next question is from Ling. Ling wants to know, is the natural language available in Power BI desktop now? Uh, the natural language Q&A is available in Power BI right now, yes. Yeah, it's been available for a while and it's continuing to improve. All right, perfect. And there's a question from Morgan. Morgan wants to know, when printing table-based data, we are restricted on number of rows. How do we work around? How to work around? Mm -hmm. Printing, so printing is a is a thing in dashboarding software. What I mean by that is it's it's a challenge. Um, I I can't talk about things that are on the roadmap that we're briefed on, um, but I can tell you that Microsoft understands this is a problem, and with Power BI Report Server uh, being an on, on premise option, there's a lot of investment going into what that uh, experience is, and uh, I would hope to see that investment soon. So there's Microsoft Data Insights Summit is coming up, uh, and I would expect a bunch of announcements around Power BI futures and new features and all that kind of stuff. So I would definitely tune in online uh, for that, and we'll have uh, we'll have wrap up videos and recaps and all that kind of stuff uh, on our site after the event. Okay, Sam wants to know: Can we use Python instead of R for custom analytics? Uh, yeah. Yes, depending upon you know what you're doing in the data, Power BI will just consume uh, from you know where you are. So if you're trying to integrate different things, whether it's R, Python, whatever, um, all of those things that run in Azure that you can use Azure Machine Learning and and R services, um, they also support Python. Python supported in SQL Server now, so it's very easy to work, work Python into your data stack with Power BI. Okay, perfect. Um, there's another question that oh. Forgive me if I pronounce your name wrong. Um, I want to say Guadam. Guadam wants to know, using Power BI Desktop, can we develop reports on live connections as opposed to offline data? Uh, you, I believe that you can. I could be mistaken on that. That's a good question. Um, but it, yeah, most of the time, it's refreshing a subset of the data to make sure that you're getting the visual uh, look and feel uh, from the data. But you can always you know, publish it locally and, you know, check it out. So there's there's lots of uh, different ways to validate that. But if the data set is huge, you're not going to work against that live data set all the time uh, in, in the entire scope of the data set because it would be super inefficient, bring a bunch of data down over the wire to your desktop. And there's some security concerns with that too. So um, I, I believe there's some settings where you can help control that, but I, I'll have to confirm that for you. Jorgen wants to know, can you share the PowerPoint? Oh presentation yes well absolutely yeah we'll get uh, we'll get that posted um, and uh, as well as a data sheet that kind of sums up these last two slides on the main services All right, perfect um, but Bahavia wants to know we have on we have on pre on premises SQL server and currently we use SSRS. We are looking for, we are looking at Power BI. I, re, I read that Power BI can be used on on-premises. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So right now, uh, Microsoft's been working to bring Power BI and reporting services much closer together. Again, I would expect more announcements about that uh, at Microsoft uh, Data Insights Summit soon. Um, but cause I can't, I can't talk about things we've been briefed on, which is hard for me to sort of separate my, my head here. Um, but it is, uh, it is a, a continuing focus for them to bring those products closer and closer together. Microsoft Power BI report server runs on premise, integrates with reporting services. So you can use, uh, things like reporting services components, uh, in Power BI reports. And I would expect that investment to accelerate, uh, and continue so that that experience will continue to be you know, more of a single experience. All right. Um, 
right. Um, okay. Um, Igor wants to know: Can you speak about can you speak about why should companies choose Tableau or Power BI? I am working. I am a working on an organization that I just can't justify that Power BI is a better tool. It's tough when Power BI keeps changing its story, flow, and logic as are a la carte. Yeah, I think um, so. It, it depends on the organization, right? I'll tell you that. But I think that we run into some companies that say, well, you know, like that, right? Power BI changes their story. I, you know, I don't think Power BI is changing their story. I think they're growing and they're evolving with what their customers are telling them, right? Tableau basically um, builds a great product, but their their cloud and portability and mobile story is uh, is a couple of years old. Um, you know, I think that Power BI's rate of innovation gets them you know, gets them in trouble sometimes, but I think they're willing to sacrifice that to constantly be adding new things, right? It's part of the reason we baked in absorbing that into our managed service, because we know that's a challenge for customers. I think that if you're looking for uh, a single data driving platform for a large number of users, Power BI is unquestionably the better choice. It scales better. Uh, it writes better queries on the back end. The performance between the platform and the data store is significantly better. Um, I would say that across most relational and non-relational systems. I don't want to speak to like an SAP HANA because I don't have I don't have data to back that up one way or the other. I've never seen Tableau running against HANA, um, but just in general, um, because it's a Microsoft tool and they have database engineers there, they're not trying to figure out how to make things run uh, like the Tableau guys are. So they're just better positioned to engineer a better product, and, and they have. Um, now Tableau has some features, some certain visualizations and a couple of other integrations that are very specific for like the journalism world. Um, just recently in the last few months, Microsoft launched a new data journalism program that's focused on making sure that journalists and newspaper and publishing houses can do everything that they want to do with Power BI. So um, what we see is uh, Tableau is evolving much more organically at this point, whereas Power BI is looking for every opportunity where they have a gap in the market or where they might not uh, have a perfect solution, quote unquote, not that there's perfect, but perfect solution. Um, and they're throwing a lot of resources and effort at all of those different things, um, which, you know, maybe uh, changing the story a bit, uh, but it's really more just the topic of the month, right? I don't think the story is changing. I just think they're adding and changing things every month. So for us, Power BI is the choice. Um, we do some Tableau work for customers and my team is routinely disappointed in that experience and they like coming back to Power BI. So that's kind of what I'm basing that on. Let's do, uh, Crystal, I think we got time for maybe one more. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, let's see. Um, Okay, Caesar has a question. Can Power BI connect to in-memory databases? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, for example, it's <clears throat> it's connecting to in-memory tables in SQL Server. We can connect to things like Snowflake, right? Um, <clears throat> keep in mind, there's no database that's truly all in-memory. Um, the data may be sitting there during processing. It may be sitting there, you know, hot and staged, but um, the memory is basically faking like it's on disk. So effectively all the same disk access, query access all, all uh, apply. Right? We're gonna run a query against it the same way we're gonna run a query against a, um, a slower database like a Redshift or something. So Crystal, I think, I uh, apologize, I think that's all the time I have. Okay. Um, I wanna thank, thank everybody for coming. We will, yeah, we'll publish the deck. We'll get, we'll get the recording out for you guys. Um, and then uh, we'll do uh, some follow-up blog posts. And uh, if you're interested in having us help you with uh, with your Power BI environment or you know, just get your team started or potentially interested in us helping knock out that backlog and help you manage your, uh, your journey, uh, let us know. Just reply yes to, uh, I think you'll get an email or poll question after the fact and uh, where we won't harass you, but we'll check in and just see how we can help. All right? Thanks, Adam. All right, everybody, thank you for joining. As Adam said, 
Um, this has been the latest and greatest with Power BI, and we do um, record the session, so you got you all will receive a link tomorrow in your email for that. Um, and if you have any more questions, please feel free to reply to that email. Thank you so much for joining. Again, this was the latest and greatest with Power BI.